Happy Sabbath. This is a special time, brothers and sisters. I really believe that Jesus is coming. I believe that we're attending some of the last meetings that we'll ever attend. I don't believe that it's accidental that anyone is here that's here today. There are some that have come from other parts of the country. There are some that have come from Canada. There are some that have come from many places, even here. And God wants to speak to our hearts. I'm inadequate to do what needs to be done today. Did you hear what I said? I am inadequate to do what needs to be done today. Fire Father, the testimony says, and the last solemn work, few great men will be engaged. They were self-sufficient. independent of God and God could not use them. In this last days, God needs humble workers that are motivated by prayer and faith. I need you to pray with me. The message that I'm going to share with you today is not simply a message, brothers and sisters. It's something that we need to be prepared for the latter rain. All around the world, God is getting a people ready. He is trying to raise up a remnant within this church that can give the message. And Satan is attacking with all his power this remnant, trying to break it up into individual atoms. But how could we answer the prayer of Christ like that, that we may all be one? And the greatest thing that happened in the upper room, my friends, was the disciples learned a lesson that it was not about themselves, but that it was about Jesus. You see, before they were looking for the first place, they were looking for their own exaltation. They were looking for their own things. But this can never happen to a church that is preparing for the latter rain. And by and far the testimonies in the chapter on the seal of God, the prophet says that those who are uniting with the world receiving the, are receiving the worldly mode and are preparing for the mark of the beast while those who are distrustful of self, those who are humbling themselves before God, those who are obeying the truth to the purification of their souls are receiving the heavenly mode and preparing for the seal of the living God. Do you trust yourself? Do you think that you're ready for Jesus to come? Do you think that everybody else has problems, but you think that you're spiritual? Let him that think if he stand take heed lest he fall. And when I speak to you, I'm speaking to me, brothers and sisters. The title of our message this morning is entitled, The Beast Within. The Beast Within. But I need your prayers and you need the prayers. I read in messages to young people that it says that when we appeal to God that Satan trembles. Do you want to make him tremble? Can you imagine a whole church uniting in prayer? Number one, 
for their own hearts to be open. We need to be open to receive the Spirit. Saying, Lord, show me my true condition of wretchedness. Because unless we sense our need, our hearts will be closed to Jesus. They that are whole don't need a physician. Number one, praying for, Lord, show me my true wretched condition. And then number two, Lord, show me Jesus, the remedy for my condition. Let's pray for the Holy Spirit to fall upon us today. Amen. Amen. If we will reverently kneel. And pointedly, please, if everybody would pray those prayers at least for our own hearts to see our condition. To see Jesus, the remedy of that condition. And then as a family pleading for the Holy Spirit to speak to us that we might receive an experience today. Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee. Lord, you know that I'm inadequate to do this. But in your strength, our weakness is made perfect. I pray for the power of the Holy Spirit to come in such a measure as we have never experienced it before. That you would open up our hearts to see individually our true condition. For the only hope of the Laodiceans is to understand the nature of their condition. But, oh Lord, not just that, because it would be hopeless if it wasn't for Jesus. May we see him high and lifted up. May his glory fill not only the temple of the heavenly sanctuary, but may his glory descend to fill the temple of our bodies here on this earth. Oh, Lord, finish the work. You know more than us that a great crisis is coming, and we're not ready. We are not ready, Lord. Thank you that we still have opportunity today. And may we see, dear Lord, the beast within. Abide with us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, chapter 24. If you will turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 24. And when you get there, would you let me know by saying amen? You'll remember that Jesus was about to die on the cross of Calvary. You will remember that when a man is about to die that he says some of his most important words and in Matthew chapter 23 you'll remember that Jesus has just with tears rebuked his people because he recognized 
he recognized that many of them was as whitened sepulchers, but inside they were full of dead man's bones. And Jesus in love was trying to warn them before it was too late. And then Jesus pointed to the temple and said, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And he said that you would not see my face hence more. And then he left. Can you imagine what it was like for Jesus to leave his temple as it were for the final time? And those disciples immediately felt a sense of doom just rested over their minds and hearts because they said, what did Jesus mean that your house would be left desolate? And Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And it was so interesting because the Mount of Olives, those disciples that were there, they weren't looking down at that temple anymore. They were looking, brothers and sisters, face to face with that temple because that, that temple rose hundreds of feet in the air. It was one of the wonders of the world. Rome itself embellished it at that time. And when the sun hit that temple, it looked like a snow capped mountain made of pure marble we are told in inspiration looked like it was made of gold of one stone and those disciples thought that it was the pride of the jewish nation and they could not believe that something could take place that would destroy that temple they thought that if something would happen to that temple that that meant that it was the destruction of the world and so they said jesus look at these temple you tell you mean to tell me these stones are going to fall Jesus says in Matthew 24, beginning in verses 2, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. The Bible says, beginning in verse 2, let's read that together. Say, Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. It was like, as I said before, someone in the Seventh-day Adventist church pointing to our institutions of higher learning. Pointing to our hospitals where billions of dollars have funded it. Pointing to our church buildings and all of these things that we had and said very soon not one of these things will continue unless it is built on the blueprint that Jesus has given us. A spirit of doom would almost settle over us. But inspiration says that very soon that me, all of these schools that are not following God's program will be shut down, we are told. Oh no, listen to me. It would be almost as serious, brothers and sisters, of God showing us that all of the money that we have spilt, spent in building our buildings, if it's not according to God's plan, what must happen to it? You know, if I was building a building and that building was not square and that building was not straight and I'm putting up a wall, if I were to pull out the plumb line, if I were to pull out a square and recognize that the building was not straight, what should I do? Well, what if we put a lot of money into it? You know, I was hearing about a, my, the church back in Florida. I used to attend the church. And they were building a new church. And one of the members of the church, their mother, uh, one of the members of the church, their father was a general contractor. contractor. And as they were building the church, the daughter was so happy about the building, saying, our new church is going up. It's almost finished. You've got to come see the, the building. And the father who loves the building said, yes, I'll come and see it. And so he goes down to see the building, and he looks at it. True story. And he looks at the building, and then he says, honey, what is this? So this is the church. Aren't you excited? He said, this is not right. This whole building must be tore down. How is it that we can see that when it comes 
to a physical structure, but when it comes to the structure of God, we don't see that same thing. God says that the most and greatest thing that we need is a revival and reformation. We must return to primitive godliness in these latter days. And Jesus said that to them, and they felt almost like we would feel today. And they said, Lord, this must be the end of the world. They said in verse 3, read it with me how they said it. They said, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came into him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? You see, they connected the two. They believed that with the destruction of the temple, that meant the end of the world. Jesus didn't tell them that then. He left it them to study it for themselves, but he gave them clear signs that were to allow them to know that his coming was near. And you'll remember the signs that he gave. This is a very familiar chapter. You'll remember that in verse 6, the Bible speaks of the wars and the rumors of wars that were to take place. You remember that God told us that this would happen just before the end and we see these wars and rumors of wars taking place as I speak today. You know over there in the Middle East now that these wars are taking place and we sometimes don't recognize its fulfillment and Bible prophecy. And these things are happening. You know, inspiration says that one of the greatest reasons why God sends war is so that he can divert the minds of the people from the work of preparation of salvation. And Satan is trying to allure our minds and he's trying to get the world in a state of fear and perplexity so that he can bring the last act in the drama. Jesus said not only would there be wars and rumors of wars, he said that nations would rise against nation, that we would see pestilence and disease and all of these things and we see them just as the Bible said. On every hand, I remember looking over the internet on some news, and I remember looking and clicking on the news, and they started talking about, in one place, flood and fires and uh, uh, hurricanes and earthquakes. It seemed like everything was one calamity preceding another. And the Holy Spirit said, go to volume 8 of the testimonies. And I remember reading where the Spirit of Prophecy says that one calamity will succeed another, and such rapid progression that the world will feel that their only hope is to allow a national Sunday law to be passed to bring the world back into favor with Jesus Christ. And we are on the verge of a great and stupendous crisis, brothers and sisters. And the burden of my heart is that you and I don't understand the work and preparation of experience that we shall need. I read one statement where Sister White said, we are not even prepared to make the preparation. Not just prepared, we are not prepared to make the preparation. And we're living in a time where God is moving upon our hearts because he knows not that he wants to close probation. Do you know that God would hold probation for a million years if it would save our souls? God is not sitting on the clock trying to make the sand go down so probation can close. God loves us and wants to save us. The reason why probation will close is because our hearts will become so hardened that we won't even want to be saved. And so God says it would make no sense if I gave them a million years because their heart is so fixed that they cannot change. And I say it reverently, even God himself cannot change it. Unless we give him our wheels. We are living in a fearful crisis. We are told, brothers and sisters, in verse 13, notice what it says. In, verse, in verses 8 it says, all these are what? The beginning of sorrows. In other words, we have not seen anything yet. That our greatest imagination and anticipation would not reach the magnitude of the ordeal that is before us. Verse 13, it says, but he that shall endure unto what? It does not say those that start. 
It says, unto him that shall endure what? Unto the end. In other words, you are going to need some patience and endurance to make it through this crisis. It's not going to be one of those where you're with Jesus today and you're with the devil tomorrow and still believe that you're going to make it. You cannot flirt with God and the devil and expect to become the bride of Jesus. Jesus will not share his love with anyone. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, keep our minds on Jesus. Do not allow the distractions of the enemy, Lord, to let our minds wander away. He is afraid of your power. But dear Lord, there are dumb dogs that won't speak. But please, Lord, let me speak thy truth. Abide with us today that our eyes may be directed to Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. We are living in a crisis hour. And the endurance that is going to take, as we heard in Sabbath school, if there is no temperance, there is no patience of the saints. First, temperance. Then patience. An intemperate man, inspiration says, can never be a patient man. And so to endure the crisis before us, something must take place deep in the hearts of man. But brothers and sisters, we cannot become intemperate by ourselves. It is the work of the grace of the Spirit in the heart. It is the fruit of God's Spirit as it was brought out very vividly this morning. We shall need an experience where we can adore through the crisis hour. What will it take to endure such, this, such an hour as this? What will give us the power and the ability to endure the final scenes of trouble that is going to hit our world? The next verse tells us the answer. After it says that he that endured to the end, the same shall be saved. And verse 4, it tells us the solution that will bring the endurance. All together and... This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Those that endure unto the end shall be saved. This gospel must be preached. In other words, it is only the gospel that can give us the endurance in this final hour. The strength does not lie in your own power. The strength lies in the power of Christ that is revealed in the gospel of Christ. In fact, the Bible says in Revelation, what book did I say? In Revelation chapter 14, notice what the Bible says. You see, God has given us a specific gospel that would give us the ability to endure the fearful scenes that are just before us. In Revelation chapter 14, it's an end-time gospel. We have called it the three angels because we see three angels flying in the midst of heaven. These are symbols of the last work of God in this earth. In Revelation chapter 14, beginning in verses 6, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Let's read that together. The Bible says, amen. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. There it is, that gospel. These angels are holding it. This is the gospel that will give us the ability to endure what is ahead of us. Without this gospel, we're lost. And this is why I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. And so it says, another God, everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. This is a worldwide gospel to every denomination. But only one people can give it. Now, brothers and sisters, this gospel brings to view all that we need. But do you know what Sister White says? and counsels to writers and editors. As you look at page 29, we are told that of these three angels, that the third angel's message is the theme of greatest importance. The third angel's message is the theme of greatest importance as it embraces the messages of the first and second angels. What is the theme? of greatest importance? 
the third angel. And when God sends messages that are so important that he could not use men, but he had to symbolize them as angels, it should cause anybody that has reasoning powers to want to diligently seek to heed this message. In fact, in verse 9, we find the third angel. And do you know that we're told that in this angel, it contains the most fearful warning and threatenings ever sent by God to man? Let's read it. In verse 9, the Bible says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast, and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand here's the warning now here's the judgment verses 10 says the same shall do what drink of the wine of the wrath of god which is poured out how without mixture i wonder what it means without mixture i wonder what it means you see, brothers and sisters, every situation that has ever happened in this world has always been tempered with the mercy of Christ. You know, some young people in this, they had this rap song that came out some years back called Gin and Juice. And they would take alcohol that was real strong, and in order to get it so that a person could drink it and even enjoy it, they would pour some juice in it so that it would dilute its strength. But here the Bible says that God is going to send something that is uh, without mixture. In other words, it is in full strength, undiluted. Now, brothers and sisters, if you know about the flood, you understand how much wrath was unfolded. In the flood, when you see the destruction, it was so bad that the spirit of prophecy says in patriots and prophets that Satan himself... Now listen, can Satan breathe underwater? That Satan himself in the conflagration of the flood was afraid for his own existence. But he could breathe. It was not the flood that frightened Satan. He had never even seen the wrath of God like that. He thought that by tempting Adam that he could gain control of the world. He said God would never send out wrath. But for the first time, he said, maybe my day is coming sooner than I thought. But brothers and sisters, even the flood was mixed with mercy. But in the last days, those who receive the mark of the beast will experience the wrath of God unmixed with mercy, without mixture. Now, Jesus never wanted us to taste that. You remember that cup that he had in Gethsemane? That is what he was drinking. But right here it says, let's read about that cup in verse 9. It says, in verse 10, it says, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Jesus took the cup, but when we receive the mark, we're saying, Jesus, you don't drink it. I want it. And then it goes on to say, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone and the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. God does not want anyone to experience this. Do you know the sister wife in the book called Early Writings? She actually saw the seven last plagues poured out. You see, in Revelation 15, 1, it says the wrath of God is contained in the seven last plagues. Sister White says she had a vision of the seven last plagues and she told God, please don't show me anymore. She said if the world only saw that the cup of iniquity, the cup of wrath was just about to be poured over their heads, they could not continue the way they were. And so the third angel is to warn us from receiving this mark. Now, brothers and sisters, 
The third angel warns against three things. What does it warn against? The worship of the beast, the worship of his image, and the receiving of his mark. Say it with me. The worship of the beast, the worship of the image, and the receiving of his mark. These are the three things that it warns against. And upon these points, we are told that a storm is coming. You know that in Great Controversy, he says, as the storm approaches a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified by obedience to the truth, will abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. She says, by uniting with the world, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light, and that when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy, popular side. Men of talent and pleasing address will become her most bitterest enemies. And brothers and sisters, instead of looking outside and saying, yes, that's everybody, she was talking about us. A great test is coming. But now, while it warns against the worship of the beast, his image, his mark, the third angel is simply a warning against worshiping the beast. And somebody says, what do you mean, pastor? If any man worship the beast or his image, the image of who? The image of the beast. Or receive his mark, the mark of who? So essentially, it's simply a warning against the beast. Either by the beast himself or the image of the beast or by the mark of the beast, but it's all the beast. Are you with me? And if you worship the beast, what does God say you receive? The wrath of God. Are you going to receive the mark? Do you want to receive the mark? <clears throat> Praise God. I don't want to receive it either. In fact, early writing says that we should make up in our minds and say, nay, I will not go along with it by the grace of Jesus. But if you won't receive the mark, what will the devil do to you? Verse 16. Revelation 13, verse 16, the Bible says, And he calls of all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or what? In their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell save he that hath the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. If you're going to go along with Jesus, every earthly support will be cut off. And those who have never made it a habit to trust in Jesus will not make it at that time. How will you buy and sell? How will you eat and live and carry on your existence in this time if you're going to follow God if you've never learned to trust him today? And so God must allow trials and dark clouds to come. You know, some of us, we say, why do we have to go through trials? Some of us, we say, why do we have to go through bad experiences where we have to trust when it seems like we never have enough? If you don't have it now, then we will receive the mark of the beast because we never learned it. And so God must allow us to go through periods of want so that we can learn to trust him so that we can make it in this final hour. Everything, can you imagine not being able to go to a store to get food? Can you imagine what type of crisis? Inspiration says that the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. And so she has warned us to get out of the cities into country places where we can deal with some of these problems. 
But do you know, brothers and sisters, that right here I was looking at an article in the paper that came out not too long ago, and it was called, an office called the OFAC office. And I wondered about this buying and selling, and here in this paper, talking about the OFAC office, this is the Office of Foreign Assets Committee. You know what this job is? It says the OFAC office is an obscure office that plays a key role in the war on terrorism. Now it says an obscure. You know what obscure means? It's not significant, but we're going to see it's very significant. It says obscure office, and then it goes on to say that plays a key role. It's charged with freezing the bank accounts and other financial assets of countries, companies, and individuals who are deemed, notice this word, enemies of the United States. Now, that would not mean so much to me if I did not have the great controversy that says in that chapter on the impending conflict, it says that those who will stand for the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order or of the state. And some are waiting for this system to be put in place, but this was 2004 and it's in place. Which means when the devil brings the system, it's because he wants to bring the crisis. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, every one of us should profess faith in the third angel's message. It's present true for this hour. It's the everlasting gospel, but we must do more than profess it. We must be sanctified by obedience to the truth of it. We must have Jesus that's going to allow us to be sanctified through it and by it, brothers and sisters. You won't be able to buy or sell. Do you know that many are going to get the mark of the beast for fear of wanting food and clothing, we're told. You seen the gas prices? We don't think about these things sometimes. It is a crisis, almost $3. We think that that's a good price now. Let there be 269 and see if everybody don't run down to that place. We are in a crisis and the majority of us don't even recognize it. And brothers and sisters, right now we don't have long. Do you know that we have a few short years at the most before this crisis takes place? And my burden is not simply to show you that. My burden is to prepare us for that. Because to know that it is coming and not have the experience to meet it, that's a tragedy. Where do you stand right now? Are you ready for the crisis now? What are husbands and wives doing right now? Are you fussing behind closed doors or do you love each other? Are parents really raising children in light of the coming crisis? Are they sending them to places that will never train them to get ready for what's coming, my friends? Are we going to jobs, getting paid a lot of money, but yet we don't know Jesus? And God is trying to warn us for this time because he knows that it's even going to get worse than this. I don't have time to stay on that right now. Verse 15, it says, And he had power to give life into the image of the beast. If not, buying and selling is not enough. Satan has another measure. He had power to give life into the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship, the image of the beast should be what? Are you ready to die for Jesus? What does it take to be in a position where you're willing to give up everything? You see, some of us, we have problems giving up little things in our lives. We think giving up certain articles of dress is something. We think giving up certain articles of food is something. 
We've been giving up certain articles of things that we watch on television or places of amusement or something. But brothers and sisters, if it's hard to give up some things, how can we give up everything? We must have a love that is stronger than ourselves. Greater love have no man than this. Then what, Jesus? Greater love have no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. If you don't know Jesus, you won't die for Jesus. If you don't love Jesus, you won't die for Jesus. For to know him is to love him. My point is that upon this third angel's message is coming a great crisis. And we are told that upon this point that the majority of those in the Seventh-day Adventist church, because they've never developed this relationship, are going to be shaken out of the church. Volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 80 and 81 says, The time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. The mark of the beast will be urged upon us. And those who have yielded step by step. It doesn't happen all at once. It's not like today you're with Jesus and tomorrow you're just simply a child of the devil. It happens step by step. First you miss devotion. Then you stop praying. It happens step by step where you made commitments before, but you turned your back on those commitments that you've made. We think that they're little things, but brothers and sisters, he that is faithful and least is faithful in much, and he that is unfaithful and least is unfaithful in much. She says that those who yield step by step to worldly demands and conform form to worldly decrees. They're not going to make it. She says, many a star that we have admired for its brilliancy will then go out in darkness. People we thought were believing in present truth. She says, ring leaders of apostasy. Behind closed doors. There is a beast within. You understand it better than a little bit. I believe that the majority of our church today that claims it, there are sincere believers that do not know what is coming and God is waiting for somebody to get filled with his spirit to waken up the sleeping giant in the Laodicean church. But before the rest can be wakened up in its majority, as little and small portion as that will be, God must have a little company that are sighing and crying. You know, most people, they say, oh, yes, I can sigh and cry, and they want to go into church and start preaching. Is that what that means? Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud. More than simply preaching, those that are sighing and crying, their prayers are raising in behalf of the church for its condition. People want to run out and preach, but how many of us are praying? Not gossip praying. Do you know what's happening in the church? Drums are coming in here. This is coming in there. Can you believe the apostle? Oh, look what the leader did. Let's pray for them. Is that sighing and crying? Can we smile and laugh about apostasy when it broke the heart of Jesus? If we can smile at it, that means that we're not heart to heart with Christ. Those that receive the seal of God will sigh and cry, brothers and sisters. They will literally cry for the abominations that are going on, not just for others, but for the sins in their own lives. There will be an internal struggle. I saw some with strong faith in agonizing Christ. 
they were pleading with God, fearful brothers and sisters. She says that great perspiration was upon their faces and they were struggling with an internal struggle. What does internal mean? This happened just before the son in law just before the crisis. In other words, some things you study happen in the future. This is taking place now. And if it's not taking place in your heart, in your home, in your church, then you're preparing for the mark. And the third angel warns against this. But listen, my friends. I want to read a statement in Matthew. What book did I say? In Matthew chapter 10, notice what the Bible says. I believe that there are some that recognize that a crisis is coming. And I believe there are some that recognize that they need to get ready. And I believe that most of us fall in that category that are here today. I don't think you would be here today if you didn't believe that a crisis was coming. But my friends, just to know that a crisis is coming. Just to know that we need to get ready and be prepared does not make us safe. In fact, sometimes we think that the danger is in the nominal churches. Well, listen, the greatest danger is in those who profess present truth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of what? This church, those that are standing to keep the commandments and have the testimony, Satan is wroth at them. The nominal churches won't have a message that can cause Satan to tremble. But brothers and sisters, while wow, we must understand that a beast is coming. Now, who is the beast anyway? What is the beast? You don't know what the beast is? What is the beast? I'm seeing a lot of answers. We should be speaking the same thing. Is there a beast? Are we afraid to say it? I heard somebody say it. It is the Roman Catholic Church system, not the people. God has many true Christians. I have met some myself and even have seen some come to the light of the truth. Many of the Christians are there. And you know, as I always say, some of the greatest devils are right here. What is the image of the beast? When you look in the mirror and you see an image, what do you see? Yourself. You see a reflection. And so the image of the beast must look something like the beast. Is that right? So it's the system that Rome has set up with a man at his head where the union has united church and state. Is church and state united in the papacy? What is the image of the beast? That form of apostate Protestantism that shall be developed when church and state unites. What is the mark of the beast? It is the mark of Rome's authority. And that mark, she says, that is the change of Saturday to Sunday. That mark of the beast is sun day worship and the third angel warns against it but my friends while this is true and we see that it's almost here isn't it you know the beast the deadly wound is almost almost healed isn't it now what constituted the deadly wound separation, separation of church and state when will the wound be healed because somebody says, well, if you're warning about the beast, doesn't the Bible say it will receive a daily wound? Yes, it does. But it also says that daily wound would be healed and all the world will do what? Amen. Wonder after the beast. Now, what about the image of the beast? Is it almost here? 
Do you know that I have papers now? Do you know that the last church, you know, Spirit of Prophecy says in Great Controversy, she says, when the leading churches of the United States united upon such points of faith that are held by them in common shall influence the state to enforce her dogmas and decrees, then Protestant America would have formed an image of the Roman hierarchy. In other words, an image of the beast. The leading churches. Do you know that in 2003 I had the paper that it says that they were trying to do it in CCT, Christian churches together? After 9-11, and they said that one church would not be a part of it. It was the Southern Baptist Church. Do you know why that's significant? The Southern Baptist Church is the largest, largest Protestant denomination in the United States. But the prophet said, when the leading churches... The Southern Baptist Church was the largest church, is the largest church. And it was not a part, you know, in 2004, the evangelicals and the Catholics came together. They signed that document. You remember that, don't you? And when they signed it, do you know the inside it, that it said that the Southern Baptist Convention said they would not be a part of it? And I looked at it, and later on I said, but Lord, the leading churches... And then one day I was coming back from a meeting and my wife, I picked up the paper and I had my wife read it like I sometimes do when we come in the car. I said, honey, read it to me so I can listen. I saw on the front cover that it said Justice Sunday. How many have heard of Justice Sunday? And inside the paper I was reading the article and she was reading it to me and it was strange. I listened to it and it was a fulfillment of prophecy already. Time would not allow me to deal with it. But when we got to the end of it, something shook my heart as I listened. At the very end, there was one person that spoke up and said, you know what? Now enough has happened. We will be a part of this union. And I wanted to see who it was, and it was signed the leader of the Southern Baptist Convention, 2005. I said, this is it. When the leading churches, there is no more leading churches that needs to unite. By 2005, it has already happened. And so I said to my wife, I'm studying this. You know what Sister White said the next step would be? When the leading church unite, they shall then influence the state. And I said, honey, something's coming. 2006, Ten Commandments Commission. Oh, I wish I had time. Ten Commandments Commission came, and the key was not just the commission, my friends. The key was their call was to move legislation. Do you know what it means? It's sooner than any one of us in here tonight recognizes. And we and our families are not ready. We're not ready. We're not ready. What else must we see, brothers and sisters? I can show you article after article. But that alone will not give you the secret to the power. So I said, brothers and sisters, I look at this before, though we may know that it's coming and that it's almost here, there is something much greater. While the third angel warns against the beast, from without, we have far more to fear from the beast within. Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 16, notice what it says. Behold, I send you forth as what? In the midst of wars, be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves, verse 17. But beware of, was he talking about men in the world or men in the church? He said you have far more to fear from where? Within. In fact, let me read you an inspired statement. First Selected Messages, page 122. We have far more to fear from within than we do from without. The hindrances to strength and success are far greater from the church itself than from the world. The greater problem is where? In the church than in the world. Now listen now. If the third angel must prepare us for this time and it warns against the beast, must it not more significantly warn against the beast, not only without, but the beast 
within. Why? For we have far more to fear from within the church than we do from with outside of the church. What do I mean? The beast has entered the church. The elements of the beast have entered the church. And there are three main elements. Now, time will not allow me to deal with all the elements. You have to get and study that yourself. Amen. I'm going to give you three elements that if these elements were not there, there could never have been a beast. And if there never had been a beast, there never could be an image to the beast. And there, if there never can be an image to the beast, then there never could be a mark of the beast. And so if you don't want the mark of the beast, then you must have the beast taken from inside of you. Number one. Do we have time to go through it? Yes. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. What book did I say? Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. And you'll remember that Christian church was started, but there came something that arose from both the outside and the inside to draw away disciples after themselves. A great apostasy of the latter days that formed the papal power. And we are told, brothers and sisters, that the first thing, let's read it in verse 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's read verse 3 first. Let's read it together. You're there, amen? amen? Let's read it together. Let no man do what? Deceive. Deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin. Who is the man of sin? Who was supposed to reveal or expose the man of sin? Seventh day Adventists. And the man of sin be revealed, that son of perdition who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he, here we see a power that not only claims to be God, but it claims to sit in his temple. In other words, it is a union of paganism and Christianity. Listen to what the prophet says. Let me read it to you. Great Controversy, page 49 and 50 says, The apostle Paul in his second letter to the Thessalonians foretold the great apostasy, which would result in the establishment of the papal power. The nominal conversion of Constantine and the early part of the 4th century caused great rejoicing. Now listen. And the world, the what? World. And the world cloaked with a form of righteousness, walked into the church. Now the work of corruption rapidly progressed. Paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, became the conqueror. Her spirit, whose spirit? The spirit of paganism. Her spirit controlled the church. Her doctrines, ceremonies, and superstitions were incorporated into the faith and worship of the professed followers of Christ. This compromise, listen, this compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin or the beast. And so if there never was paganized Christianity, there could never be a Roman Catholic church system that simply took Christian ideas to clothe pagan customs. You remember the idols they brought into the churches? image worship, and they took their same pagan worship altars and just called them Peter, James, and John and called them saints instead of gods. But it's not enough to warn against the beast without. We have far more to fear from within. Paganized Christianity in this church? What about when we take the music of the world and blend it with Christian lyrics? What about when we take the amusements of the world and put them on a Christian disguise? What about when we take the education of the world and put on a Christian label? Is it not wolves and sheep's clothing? And Jesus would have none of it. 
John the Baptist wanted none of it. He said it would have unfit him for his public ministry. And in this last generation, maybe not everybody, but in this last generation, God must get some young person, some adult, some family that is willing to leave the elements of the beast alone, no matter if it causes them to lose out on everything. When we take the wedding band, let me come back to that. Listen, listen, listen. Do you know that we're told that degrees originated with the popes? And we put it in our papers. Were we to be educated? We were supposed to be the most educated people in all the world. Nothing wrong with education. We must be educated. In fact, the first school on earth was called the Eden School. And we're told in heaven there will be a heavenly school. God loves education, but not false education. False education disconnects us with Jesus. The wisdom of the world, 1 Corinthians 1.21 says, causes us not to know Jesus. Professing ourselves to be wise, we can become fools. The wedding band, we know that when you look at the history of it, we are told that the church of Rome instituted it, took it from the world, and put a Christmas card. All oh, it just represents that we're being married. Do we need a circlet of gold to say that we're married? How many divorces is it saving? When the rates of the church are the same as the rates of the world, how in the world is that saving our marriages? Oh, we need a circle, but it cannot be bought at Tiffany's. We need a sacred circle that binds husband and wife and homes together in the love of Jesus. And Adventist home teaches you how to get that sacred circle. Paganized Christianity. And if we will accept blending the world and the church, then when the Sunday law comes, remember, the Sunday Sabbath is nothing more than a result of paganized Christianity. They took the day of pagans, put on the Christian disguise, and they called the Christian Sabbath, but it's pagan, Christianized worship. And if you have the elements of pagan Christianity in you and your church, it will go along with it. Number two. The exalting of human wisdom above the words of inspiration. The papacy claims that the Bible is not the standard. They claim that tradition and the words of popes are the standards. That if the Pope says something contrary to the Bible and puts it in a cannon bowl, what will they believe if they are faithful Catholic, the Bible or the Pope? They have exalted human wisdom above the words of inspiration. There could never have been a papacy if that was not the case. In fact, look at what this says in Great Controversy, page 596. It says, the Roman church reserves the clerk to the clergy the right to interpret the scriptures on the ground that ecclesiastics alone are competent to explain God's word. It is withheld from the common people. They said the regular few members, they can't understand it, so don't worry about it. We'll take care of it for you. It's withheld from the common people through, though the Reformation gave the scriptures to all, yet, listen, the self-same principle which is maintained by Rome prevents multitudes and Protestant churches from searching the Bibles for themselves. They are taught to accept the teachings as interpreted by the church and there are thousands who dare receive nothing, however plainly revealed in scripture, that is contrary to their creed or the established teaching of the church. We're told whenever that happened, the church was about to die. I wonder if we as Seventh-day Adventists have come so close to creeds that we no longer believe the Bible. You see, we have far more to fear from within the church than from without. Never mind those popes who say that, yes, warn against it, but there's something worse that you and I need to get ready for. You know, there's some, I remember I was getting ready to go speak in one place and the pastor talked to me. You don't mind if I just talk to you, do you? The pastor talked to me on the phone. And I couldn't believe the conversation. My wife gave me the phone. I'm talking to him. He says, yes, some people want you to come down to a church. But I just have a couple of questions for you. 
What is your stand on jewelry? I talk with him. Then he said to me, he said, are you a, almost, uh, I can forget, forget the exact words, are you a good Seventh-day Adventist? Do you believe in the church manual? I said, I believe in the Bible. Now, when the church manual says what the Bible says, there's nothing against it, but we must understand what the devil is doing. The devil takes something that does not seem wrong in itself, but he takes it step by step. Do you know that in Review and Herald, November 20, 1883, that the Seventh Adventist Church voted in general conference session that they were never to have a church manual? It wasn't something the offshoots made up. The next week in November 27, same year, same article, they said that unanimously, the general conference president said, I hope that we will never ever meet this issue again. They said, we already have our church manual. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction, for correction and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. What else do you need? As if that was not enough, Jesus said, let me not only give them glasses, but let me give them some bifocals. Not only the Bible, but the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. We have the inspired words. Do you know that in the last general conference session, 2005, it was voted and said that Sister White cannot define doctrine, but only enhance it? And we agree to this? Do you know that we're told that the very last deception of Satan would be to make of none effect the testimony of God's Spirit? And there are many ways to do that. I'm coming back. Number three. The idea of salvation. Great controversy. 595 says, 572 says, the secret, the what? Of the power of the papacy or the beast. Listen. A prayerful study of the Bible would show Protestants the real character of the papacy and would cause them to abhor and to shun it. But many are so wise in their own conceit that they feel no need of humbly seeking God that they may be led into the truth. Some say, I already know this. Although priding themselves on their enlightenment, they are ignorant both of the scriptures and of the power of God. They must have some means of quieting their conscience, and they seek that which is least spiritual and humiliating. Listen. What they desire is a method of forgetting God, which shall pass as a method of remembering him. I think I need to repeat that. Would you mind if I repeat that? What they desire is a method of forgetting God which shall pass as a method of remembering Him. So they would want to make it appear that what they do, what they are doing is bringing God to view while in reality it's pushing Him away. Less love. But they're not loving. You can't come in possession of love trying to love. It is the fruit of the Spirit. The unconsecrated heart cannot originate or produce it. It dwells only in the heart where Jesus reigns. Amen. And for Jesus to come in, the beast must go out. We have far more to fear from within than we do from without. Listen. The papacy is well adapted to meet the wants of all these. Listen, this is the point. It is prepared for two classes. How many? How many? Let's listen for the two classes. It is prepared for two classes of mankind embracing nearly the whole world. Only the remnant are not embracing this. Listen. Number one, those who would be saved by... I'll come back to that one. Number two, those who would be saved in their sins. This is the secret of the papacy. 
Many people don't want to give up sin, so they come up with a method of re what they call remembering God, which makes them forget God. In other words, they come up with a gospel that would allow them to continue in sin and still say that they will have salvation. This is where we get the idea that we will be sinning until Jesus comes. Well, friends, if you're sinning until Jesus comes, you're not going to heaven. There will be some that are sinning until Jesus comes, but it will not be the redeemed. These are those that keep the commandments of God. There are some that want to be saved there, but Jesus, do you know that the cross was not to save us in sin? It was to save us from sin. If the cross was to save us in sin, Jesus would be an accomplice to the wretchedness that we see today. It is an affront to God to say that you love Jesus and yet you want to hang on to some darling sin in your life. We need help, brothers and sisters. Matthew 1 says, And they shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people not in their sins, but from their sins. Do you know why? You see, Satan doesn't want us to understand this. You know why? Desire of Ages 671 and 672 says, the honor of God. The honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of His people. That if we are not perfected, God is dishonored. Can we do it in our own strength? Jesus says, without me you can do, but with me all things are possible. For in Christ he will both will and do of his good pleasure. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Do you believe it? The gospel is the power of God and to salvation. But number one, which I call number two now, not only some that would be saved in their sins, but remember, it embraces nearly two classes nearly representing the world. This is the secret of the papacy. It wants to be saved not only in sin, but there's another class that wants to be saved by their merits or by their works. They believe now, we may not say it theoretically, but sometimes very practically, we believe that what we do is what's bringing us salvation. And all the reforms in the world could never bring salvation unless it was Jesus. Do you know that reformation without Christ is hypocrisy? And there are a lot of people that say, oh, education reform, dress reform, health reform, diet reform, all these reforms, but they lost the heart reform that will bring everything else. Please listen, please listen. Every one of us listen. Because see, it embraces two classes. And normally we get off balance. Some get excited when it's talking about save in merits. Some get excited when it's talking about save there. But Christ wants to bring us to the place where we will sigh and cry because we have far more to fear from within than from without. I'm coming back. Listen. Those who will be saved by their merits, here is the secret of the power of the papacy. The idea of salvation. And so God has given us a beautiful plan of redemption that saves against each extreme. The sanctuary teaches that we cannot be saved in sin, but it teaches that the Lamb of God is the only one that can save us. Only the sanctuary can lead us into a path that leads straight to the kingdom of God. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? But now, my friend, I come to what I believe is the most important part. The third angel warns against the beast, does it not? And we said that we have far more to fear from within the church than we do from without, did we not? 
But my friends, we have far more to fear from within our own hearts Amen. than we do in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen. You know, there's so many people, they tell me sometimes, I wonder if this person's a Jesuit. Now, are they Jesuits? Oh, yes, they're a very real entity. They go in and they, have, they go in and start integrating themselves and try to do things. But listen to me. If you were to compare how many times Sister White talks about Jesuits to how much she talks about the sanctuary, you know why? You see, many of us are more interested in what the Jesuits are doing than what Jesus is doing in the most holy place. You know, there are men that can show all the, all the errors that the Jesuits have brought into the church, but in their own homes and hearts, they're doing far worse. How in the world can we point our finger at the general conference and say that it's no longer a part of God's organization because of apostasy, and yet in our own homes, we're not living in according to the truth? How can we say that they have caused, uh, that they are bringing in paganized Christianity when in our own televisions, our own music, our own life, we are paganized Christians? Having a Christian disguise and a pagan art, a form of godliness without the power, it's paganized Christianity, my friends. White and sepulchers, full of dead men's bones. Number two, exalting human wisdom. Well, I think that's right for them, but the spirit of prophecy doesn't mean it when it comes to me. Oh, that sister's not wearing the right dress. That brother's not wearing the right thing. But what does the spirit of prophecy say about our things? You see, we love to quote the spirit of prophecy to move our campaigns. But to believe the spirit of prophecy means more than simply saying, I believe the prophet when I want to preach it. It means that even when it lays bare your own sins, that even when it lays bare the deformity and the practices of your own heart and home that you say, Lord, thou hast the words of eternal life. Where can I go? You see, we're so quick to see what's out, but we don't see what's in. There's a beast within. And we go by what we think and feel, but not the inspired word of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. How are you running your children? I can never imagine, you know, that far worse than any Jesuit or subverted person is the father or mother that are unconverted. We're so intent about these other things, but what are we doing in our homes? And then we say, why about children not the way they are? They're, they're, they're that way because of us. Amen. Number three, the idea of salvation. You see, it's not enough to say what the church believes. What do you believe about salvation? Now, you can't answer this by yourself. You cannot answer this by yourself because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked Amen. who can know it let him that think of he stand take he lest he if you think you're right guess what peter said lord i'll go to you to death i'll die for you jesus you know, Sister White says in volume six of the testimonies, page 400, she says there are now men that are saying they're ready to take up weapons of war that will leave first and leave this church. What is your idea of salvation? Don't think about what everybody else says. What about you? Do you believe that you can be saved in your sins? 
Do you believe that those sins that God has showed you, that you can continue with those sins, and yet it just means everybody else needs victory, but you don't have to get victory? And the quietness of your own home, when no one else is looking, and God told you about that television program you're watching. And you used to be convicted about it. But you say, you know, God let that slide. He didn't really mean this. That article of food that you put in your mouth. And God says, you know, your body is the temple of God. Don't destroy yourself by that. He said, oh, that's just a small thing. It's just chocolate. It's just caffeine. God knows I have to work too long. I can't spend time in devotion and prayer. God knows that. Oh, sure, the church must be perfect, but I don't have to be perfect. God disowned the church. God can't give righteousness by faith to the church, but somehow he'll do it for me. Saved in your sins. Do you believe it's going to happen? Jesus did not even die to save us in sins. His death paid a price to save us from sin. Or do you believe that you'll be saved by your works? Now, you may not preach that. You may not teach that, but you might think that there's something that you can do. Some change that you can make by yourself that amounts to something. And even if you made the change, it didn't change your heart. You know, there's a person that can change their diet and their dress and burst hell wide open. But listen, if Christ is in your heart, you'll make the change. Not because you have to, in the sense that you're trying to force yourself, but because if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's an issue of love, my friends. If you love him, you'll obey him. If you don't love him, you won't obey him. And if you obey him without love, it's worthless. Let me read something to you. And Steps to Christ, page 45, the prophet of God says this, 44. There are those who profess to serve God while they rely upon their own efforts to obey his law, to form a right character and secure salvation. Their hearts are not moved by any deep sense of the love of Christ, but they seek to perform the duties of the Christian life as that which God requires of them in order to gain heaven. Now listen to the next words. Such religion is worth nothing. 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 When Christ dwells in the heart, the soul will be so filled with his love with the joy of communion with him that it will cleave to him. And in the contemplation of him, somebody says, how do I forget about myself itself? In the contemplation of him, self will be forgotten. Love to Christ. Love to who? Love to who? Love to Christ will be the spring of action. Those who feel the constraining love of God. And you know what the burden is? There are some who claim to be reformers and they say, oh, you can't talk about love because that will cause a compromise. Such a one doesn't understand love. You see, love will not lower the standard. Love will exalt it to its highest plateau. Listen to what it says. It says, those who feel the constraining love of God do not ask how little will be given to meet the requirements of God. They don't say, do I just have to take off that? Can I still hold on to this? That's not love. 
If you are saying, how much can I hold on to instead of how much I can give up, then you don't love Jesus. Because love gives up everything. Everything. Somebody said to me one time I was preaching, they said, Pastor, each night I come out to the meeting, something else is being taken away. And I said, Sister, before it's over, I'm going to take away everything. Because what in us is good? What in us can be salvaged in and of itself? We are altogether filthy, brothers and sisters. There is none good, no, not one. Nothing in us is good. All must be transformed completely. But listen, when you give everything, you receive everything. That's beautiful. What would you feel like to exchange $10 for a million dollars? To exchange your wicked heart for the perfect righteousness of the heart of Christ. The watchword of all true education and of all true living is something better. When God takes away something, he wants to give you something better. And true love, it says, they do not ask for the lowest standard, but true love aims at perfect conformity to the will of their Redeemer. With earnest desire, they yield all and manifest an interest proportionate to the value of the object which they seek. Listen, a profession of Christ. A what? A profession of Christ without this deep love is mere talk, dry formality, heavy drudgery. Now, I said all that to say this. Every one of us has the beast within. Not just in the world. Yes, it warns about that. Not just elements in the seven heaven church. Yes, it warns about that. But the most important part is that beast in your heart and in my heart. And do you know when the Bible says that all the world is going to run after the beast? Do you know what it's saying? That if you still have the elements of the beast in your heart, that when the beast from without, when his daily wound is healed, that the beast from without will find answering cord to the beast within, and they will unite and wonder because it will attract each other. And if there are any elements of the beast within your heart, when the beast enforces the mark with his image then I don't care what your profession is you will wonder if you're a pagan Christian if you believe the words of yourself above the words of inspiration if you don't have the right idea of salvation you will wonder brothers and sisters you remember what it said about Jesus when the devil came to him and it said that there was nothing in Jesus that the devil could could use she says that he was not able to, he was not even able to sin, not even by thought. She says, this must be the condition that those who will be found who will go through the time of trouble. Not even by thought. We must be just like Jesus. In vain do you keep your traditions. In vain you worship me. Teaching For doctrine, the commandments of men, is not that which is without that defiles a man. Does it make sense now? It's not that which from without that defiles a man. It's that which is within him. Mark chapter 7. You see, because evil thoughts proceed from out of the heart, from the abundance of the heart the mouth speak. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If the beast is in your heart, this is why you will follow the mark of the beast. And the question today is, is, has the beast within you been conquered? The sunny law is about to be passed. The, the daily wound of the beast is almost healed. And the majority of us, the beast is still alive and well. And there's only one way to take this beast out. There's only one person strong enough to remove him. 
You remember in Revelation 20? When someone came down and locked up the devil for a thousand years. You need to know who that is. Now, my friends, this is why God gave us the Laodicean message. Not simply to apply it to others, but so, that, so we can say, I am wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I am in this sad condition. And God is waiting right here before he can get the loud cry going. Do you know that no one can receive the latter rain until they receive personally the Laodicean message? That the destiny of the church hangs upon this. It must work upon the heart of the receiver, leading him to exalt the standard and to pour forth the straight truth. Then she says, I saw some would not bear that straight testimony. They will rise up against it, and this is what will cause the shaking. But it starts with somebody receiving it personally. I'm wretched. I'm miserable, I'm poor, I'm blind, I'm naked, I'm in trouble. Jesus, I need your help. And the counsel of the true witness says, if you come... You know what he says at the end of that, at the end of, at the end of that, 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 that application, that testimony, and that, and that counsel? He says, behold, I stand at the door and what? You know what he wants to do? He wants to come in. And when he comes in, what do you think he's going to do with the beast? He's going to boot him out. And so you must say, Come in to my heart. Right now, your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, and you're saying, Lord, is the beast still alive within my heart? Is there something in my life that needs to come out? Is there something in my heart that is keeping me from receiving the Spirit of Jesus? God is knocking this morning, my friends. And it's not accidental that you're here today. God is speaking to our hearts and he says, I want you to be saved. And someone asked me yesterday, they said, Pastor, I don't know how to give my will to Jesus. How do I give my will to Jesus? Inspiration says it's very simple. She says everything depends upon the right action of the will. She says, if it wasn't for these simple words, I would not know how to find Jesus. Listen to what the prophet says. Please listen. Don't listen to me. Listen to Jesus. It is not enough to be familiar with the arguments of the truth alone. You must meet the people through the life that is in Jesus. Your work will be made wholly successful if Jesus is abiding with you. For he said, without me, you can do nothing. Jesus stands knocking, knocking at the door of your hearts. And yet for all this, some continually say, I cannot find him. Listen to what she says. Why not? He says, I stand here knocking. Somebody says, Jesus feels so far. Where is he? I don't care where or how many sins you have done. Jesus is knocking right at the door of your heart. He's even at the door. Some say continually, I cannot find him. Why not? He says, I stand here knocking. Why do you not open the door and say, inspiration actually tells us what to say. Why not open the door and say, come in, dear Lord. Now, if I was you, I would say that in my own heart. Come in, dear Lord. In quotation. She goes on to say, I am so glad for these simple directions as to the way to find Jesus. If it were not for them, I should not know how to find him whose presence I desire so much. Will you ask him to come in? There are some here today that know that they have been playing with God. You have been flirting with the ways of the world and with the ways of Jesus and you're in the valley of decision and today God is saying, how long halt ye between two opinions? You don't care about what everyone else is doing. Your mind is directed. Not, you're not distracted by anything. Your mind is focused. In my, is my heart right? 
And there's someone that says, Lord, I want to be born again. I want my sins forsaken and confessed. If there's someone here today that says, I need to be reconsecrated, then I want you to stand right where you are. Somebody that says, Lord, I want to be reconsecrated. Maybe there's someone here that says not only reconsecration. You know, on the day of Pentecost, when those men were pricked to the heart, they said, what shall we do? And Peter, under divine inspiration, says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. 